So I've already started with a somewhat convoluted definition in proton-proton collisions where my observable is what I get out of a jet finder. And then I'm gonna put this already complicated observable into a heavy ion collision. So what you see here is an event display of a jet in proton-proton collisions in the STAR experiment. And you see, this is a dijet event, which is the most, common, the most common type of event with jets. And so you can at least kind of see that there's two back-to-back -back jets. And then you're gonna put it in this mess where multiplicities here, the, the number of particles in a jet in proton-proton collisions is typically 10 to 25 or so. You can get jets with a lot of particles, but you know, it's not that many particles compared to here. You are talking about thousands of particles in a um, in a typical detector, in a detector's acceptance. So you have to look at this mess. This is what I do. I look, try to, I'm trying to look at this mess and I'm trying to pluck these things out of there. So where do I have jets in here? Um, and what we do, the, the standard paradigm is that we have an inherent assumption that there is background and that they are, there is signal and that the two are separated and clearly defined. Um, and you get, so you have these jets that are combinatorial jets. We use this phrase. What we mean by that is that they're random particles so that the particles the jet finder clusters into a jet um, have nothing to do with each other. Um, the, so remember that when we looked at what the jet finder did to a proton proton collision, it puts every particle into a jet candidate. So it's going to do the same thing in a heavy ion collision. Every particle is in a jet candidate. That doesn't mean that every particle comes from what we would think of, what we want to think of as a jet. The term is sometimes used that these combinatorial jets are fake jets. I like the term combinatorial better because who am I to judge what's real and fake? If you run a jet finder on an event, it will give you jet candidates. And if you had a really good model for heavy ion collisions and you ran your jet finder on a model and data, Without any background subtraction, the two should be comparable. The problem is we don't have any models that are that are good to the point where you'd be able to make good, good quantitative statements out of that. So there are also things that are in a gray area where you may have, say, a quark. Let's say this is a quark. It comes in, it hits a gluon in the medium that gluon now has some momentum from the quark and it goes out and it hadronizes. So it forms a particle, um, it forms maybe a pion. That, is that pion part of the jet or not? I don't know. Um, so you have what is sort of somewhere between purple and blue. So it, is it background? Is, is it not? Um, that depends on, you have to make a better definition. So um, we had a plot similar to this. Well, I had this exact plot from talking about proton-proton collisions that you already have. You have some model for your hard scattering and um, you have, in this case, a quark and an anti-quark coming out and forming final state particles. Um, 
even in proton-proton collisions, you have this form things into jet candidates. You add heavy, you put this in a heavy ion background. And now you have combinatorial jet candidates. So things that you aren't trying to measure because they're just drawing from random, uh, they're just clumping particles together randomly. You have energy smearing from the background. So here, if you have this jet, this jet has some background particles in it. And that's gonna mean that the energy that you measure for that jet is not the energy you wanted to measure, which is the energy of the red particles or maybe the red particles plus the purple particles. So that means your measurement, you're not measuring the, exactly what you wanted to do and wanted to measure. So you have to correct for it or you can correct for it. Um, and we do a lot of tricks that suppress, that I'm not gonna talk too much about, but they suppress this, these combinatorial um, jets and make it easier to, to uh, correct the jet energy and subtract the combinatorial jets. Um, but what we're doing is always to focus on small jets and very high energy jets. So this already kind of messy definition gets a lot messier. Um, this is the background density. Um, so the number, the amount of energy in a heavy ion collision. And this is as a function of the um, number of particles produced in the collision. So on this side, you have very central collisions where the two nuclei were essentially overlapping. And on this side, they were just barely interacting. Um, and what you see is that the background scales roughly linearly with the number of particles in your detector. So how, how many particles were produced in the collision? Um, I will spare you how you measure this because I don't want you to get too bogged down in the details. This, um, this side is showing you data. Um, another thing I want to point out is that you have smearing. So your background is, you, there's some width. So for any given jet, you can say what the average background is fairly well, that's the black line, but uh, figuring out what the, um, what the spread is, any individual jet will actually have a different background. Um, so this, this causes a problem that when you think, if you think about measuring an individual jet as, so that's your measurement, this is taking what you're trying to measure and smearing a lot. Um, it's, smearing your, it's smearing what you're actually measuring. So um, if I try to think of, um, if, I, if I try to think of a, a different example, let's say that you want to measure the height of the average physics major. I don't know why you want to measure it, but so you do this by putting a sensor on the building that measures the height of people going in and out of the building. Um, and in that case, most of your measurement, you're going to be very background dominated because we have probably about at least 10 times as many people coming in the building to take a gen ed class as who are physics majors. And the physics majors also tend to come in the building and stay all day and the non-majors tend to come and go. Um, so then you would have those non-majors smearing your measurement of the average height. Um, and you would, well, they're, they're, they're changing the average height 
and you would have to uh, you would have to know how many to subtract. You know how many were physics majors and how many were not. You could maybe try to subtract an average height of a non-physics major, um, but you don't have independent measurements. So you're not gonna measure the right thing all the time. Um, so this makes it hard to do these measurements. The good news is, so that here's some model calculations in a phenomenological model that we, the little toy model we came up with. And you know these fits are not, random, there's actually, you can estimate what it should look like. You can see that the two fits, they don't they have a different intercept, but they have very similar, um, very similar slopes. So it, and there's a number of other things I dropped from my slides just to simplify. The background is pretty consistent with being randomly, what you'd get from randomly drawing particles from your event. Um, taking into account a couple of the correlations we know about. Okay, so maybe, so how do you try to quantify this a little more? You can draw random cones in your event, and that's a measure of your background. Um, it's not quite what was done in the other slide, but we're going to fudge over that detail. Um, so you draw random cones in your detector. So this is um, pseudorapidity, so direction along the beam pipe, and then this is azimuth, so it actually would wrap around the, the detector. And you're just randomly drawing cones in your detector and adding up all of the energy. And you look at the width of that distribution. So this shows what you get in data. Um, the blue points are, well, the red points are the raw data. The blue points are when you throw out the leading jet. Um, and the black points are what happens when you randomly assign a position of, uh, you take a track and randomly reorient it in the detector. So the difference here is when you're breaking some known correlations. You guys heard about this in the videos about flow. It's breaking those flow correlations um, so that it's, it's decreasing, it's, that's decreasing the width a little bit. And then this looks consistent with a totally random background. This has the, some additional structure. For the red data points, this is throwing out the two leading jet candidates. And this again on the x-axis is central collisions and peripheral collisions, central, peripheral, um, so, and this is the standard deviation. So you guys would have run into the standard deviation elsewhere. And the lines show what you would get if you had a totally random background. Um, so you see that um, the, this is a, in pretty good agreement. And what you see here is comparison to a model called Pythia Angantir. Um, there's a couple points. So first of all, it looks like we are actually drawing a random background, pretty close to a random background in heavy ion collisions. But maybe the bigger point is that you have a background even in a model. So that poses some difficulties when you're trying to come up with ways to compare them. All right, I'm going to skip that one. So um, the mini summary, jet finders are gonna put everything in a, in a jet candidate and the background is dominated by random particles. Models have background too. Um, so this is a picture of what you get when you run your anti-KT jet finder on a heavy ion collision, which has particles everywhere. You get jets everywhere. Whereas if we use our qualitative picture we're trying to go with and say, well, what is a jet? We'd probably think of these two guys as jets, not necessarily these guys. Okay. 
So how do we deal with background? Um, one way, so this background is always, so for the anti-KT jets, the size of the jet, the area goes like pi r squared most of the time. So one way you make your jets, you, the one way you make your background smaller is to focus on smaller radii jets. You're looking at these small jets. You'll see all of you guys, all of your papers are proton proton measurements of jets done in heavy ion collisions. Or sorry, done in heavy ion um, experiments, in a heavy ion experiment, at least. So they all focus, if you, if you were to listen to particle physicists and say, oh, I wanna measure jets, they would tell you measure large radius jets because all of those small corrections are really, really hard. Um, and I'm not, I don't have a lot of confidence in my, um, in my calculation. So measure jets that are as large as you can. In heavy ion collisions, the problem is the background scales with the radius squared. So we want to measure small jets. And you'll see the standard resolution parameter in a heavy ion collision is 0.2, um, which is small for a particle physicist. Um, that also means that sometimes what you got, your papers are actually testing if you read the discussions. So part of the reason these papers were measured was to provide a benchmark for heavy ion measurements that someone wants to do. Um, but that also means that they're sensitive to parts of perturbative quantum chromodynamics, our theory, that we haven't necessarily tested that well. So that means, so you'll see some discussion of that in your guys's papers. Okay, so smaller radii makes the background overall small, smaller. Now this, uh, this is the prediction. This is a, well, this is a fit, um, but we can also describe it by a prediction of what this should be. Um, and it's in pretty good agreement, but the problem that we have with the measurement is actually the spread more. It's not so much the height of this, but it's how wide it is. And you'll see that the distribution is a lot wider here, which is where we try to do most of our measurements in heavy ion collisions, central collisions, than it is here, which are not so interesting to us. Still interesting, but um, we think we form the QGP. We're pretty confident we form the QGP here. Um, and there's long discussions we could have about what's going on there. When I was in grad school, everybody said we did not have QGP there. Um, so a problem with focusing, so if we have a smaller R, our fluctuations are smaller because to get the actual background, you take this density and multiply by the area. So your fluctuations are smaller. If your, your background's smaller, but your, the bit real thing, your fluctuations are smaller if you have a smaller radius. The downside is that a lot of the modifications we're trying to study are at larger radius. Another downside is that it biases us towards quark jets um, and we're trying in principle to solve both, um, to, to learn about both. And it really makes it a lot easier to measure quark jets. So if you look at a measurement, it can be hard to tell if you see more or less modification because of what's going on in the medium or because your measurement is only looking at quarks and not gluons. Um, another thing that people do is that they focus on high momentum. So this, um, this you'll see has a minimum momentum of 150 MeV, which is rather low. Um, the argument for doing that, so remember our goal was to measure things that are, um, that are collinear safe. So if you have, that means that 
if you have a gluon split into two gluons with the same energy, you would still get the same final. With, so an eight GeV gluon splits into two four GeV gluons going in the same direction. Your jet finder should find the same jet either way. Any momentum cut, and the reason for that is because your models are not very good at describing that. So you don't want to be sensitive to it. Any momentum cut is going to hurt that. Um, is going to mean that you're not actually collinear safe, so your models are less reliable. Um, so you, the, the momentum cut is bad, so that's why it's low here. A lot of measurements done by Atlas and CMS start jets at um, one or two GeV, so an order of magnitude higher for the constituents. Why do they do that? If you have fewer particles, you have fewer um, you have fewer background part. If you your background has a different shape than your your signal, so here you can see um, this is in a model, and this dashed line right here is roughly corresponding to what we would call the background, and the black line right there is the signal, and this is showing single particles, but the principle is the same. You know, you're always going to have some background wherever you cut, but your signal to background ratio is a lot higher here than it is here. Um, so if you want to be, um, if you want to be more confident you're measuring signal, that you're measuring real jets, you can require high momentum particles or only look at high momentum jets. Um, the, the problem is that we actually expect most of the modifications to be at low momentum. So if you're only looking at low momentum, then you are not seeing the, um, you're not necessarily looking at the interesting thing. It also could lead to survivor bias, um, which basically means you're only looking where um, you're only looking at jets that survived interacting with the medium. So there's a lovely story that I like to, to quote where there was a mathematician um, working for the, the allies in World War II and, um, and the generals looked at where airplanes came. I think I don't have that in here, um, but the generals were looking at where airplanes had holes when they returned from battle. Here's my terrible airplane. Um, and they would say, well, when if we look at the places where the airplanes have holes, um, all the airplanes coming back have holes here. So we should reinforce the armor in those places. And the mathematician said, no, the airplanes that get shot there are able to fly back. You want to reinforce the armor here because airplanes that get shot there crash and are unable to return. Um, that's survivor bias. You're only looking at the things that, um, that survive your cuts and it, and so you have to make sure that you think about that when you're interpreting the data. We had another one, my, my husband brought up some paper on COVID and said, well, yeah, but there's a, a, the fraction of people who are vaccinated who end up hospitalized with COVID when they get COVID is three times higher than for unvaccinated people. And I went, no, <laughs> the fraction of people who, you know, so the problem there is that you're only diagnosing the people who are sick enough to get diagnosed with COVID. And if you're vaccinated, you're less likely to get the test in the first place. So um, you're not looking at an unbiased sample. So you always need to think, care if you learn anything from this class, because none of you are gonna go on to be heavy ion physicists. Think about what your measurement is actually telling you. 
but whenever you interpret any piece of data, stop and think about what it's really telling you, what was really measured. Um, that is where people usually go, go wrong. So it's easier to look at high momentum stuff, but it's not necessarily the most important or what you need to be looking at. Um, so here you can actually see um, this was, um, this is the red is what you get if you run a jet finder over all events and subtract your background. So one thing that you see is that you have jets with a negative momentum sometimes. And the reason for that is those fluctuations that sometimes if you're always subtracting the average background, sometimes you will get jets that have a negative momentum, which is does not make physical sense. Um, but all you're doing is subtracting the average background. That's why you need to correct the, for the fluctuations. And then as the different colors show what happens to this distribution, as you add increasingly high requirements that there be tracks of increasingly high momentum. So here you are requiring at least one 10 GeV track inside your jet. And um, what's good is, so this is where we have combinatorial jets and you see that the combinatorial jet part gets suppressed every time you add a higher momentum cut. You also can see that even out here where, um, uh, where you get, uh, where you have, what we would generally call real jets, um, the orange stars are still below the blue. So you're still suppressing some jets out here where we think they're real. And there was a question in the chat, is that what you mean when you're subtracting underlying event in the jets? That's a perfect, Rhea, thank you. Oh, perfect, thank you. That was, that's a very good question. The short answer is yes. Um, the heavy ion background subtraction is like what you do in proton-proton measurements on steroids. So even in proton-proton collisions, you can get particles in the collision that are totally unassociated with the jet. They have nothing to do with the jet. Um, and you subtract these out. And we actually um, used methods in heavy ion collisions that were developed for proton-proton collisions. The reason they developed them for proton-proton collisions was uh, something called pileup. So when you have Atlas and CMS looking for production of the Higgs, which is a very rare particle, they try to have, they need as many proton-proton collisions as possible. So they, um, they actually run, we call it a luminosity. That's the rate at which the collisions uh, are provided. They have so many, they run at such intensities that um, you have more than one proton-proton collision recorded by your detector at once. Um, and sometimes even in the same bunch crossing. So they, uh, that's when you should have, when you have these bunches of protons coming in, some, the, there's so many protons in each bunch when they smack together that multiple protons, you have multiple proton-proton collisions. And that's a problem for particle physics because their models generally only describe um, one proton-proton collision at a time. Um, so you can treat that background the same way we've done it in heavy ion collisions and subtract off what's going on in all these other collisions. So you're only looking at, you're only looking at the true jet. It's a little simpler in that case because your background is totally uncorrelated with your signal. In our case, our background and our signal are somewhat correlated. Um, so the level of background, if I, let me jump back. So here in proton-proton collisions, you are somewhere, um, 
you're way down at the bottom of this axis, but you still would fit on the plot. Except if you have, um, if you have, sometimes they have 50 to 100 proton-proton collisions in, the, um, in a detector at a time. And your mean multiplicity is about <clears throat> 25 at LHC energies. So you probably get, you would get at the highest, um, at the highest luminosities, you would end up somewhere here on this plot. So that's why you have to subtract the background. And the techniques are very similar. We're gonna walk you guys through how you actually do. Oh, here's my survivor bias slide. Um, yeah, so we're gonna walk you through how to do it, but yes, you're doing basically the same thing except that your background is lower. Okay, so here's the picture off of Wikipedia. Um, and, you know, when holes in planes returning indicate that it's actually safer to get there. Um, so the other thing is um, you have these jets and these jets are very large and you would think that you would always be able to see them. If you have a large enough jet, you can see it standing out from the background, but just because something is large does not mean that it's always easy to see. So if I had shown you this picture first, you would not immediately see the elephant. You only saw it because I was slowly backing out. Um, and so, you know, some, this I'm not gonna go, I, you do not have to know this in detail, but, um, you get these biases from your background. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to inflict background subtraction algorithms on you because they are convoluted and uh, a little crazy. And our poor theorists have struggled to figure them out. Um, I struggle to figure them out. We actually implemented one of them in Rivet and then talked to the people who had done the paper and they seriously said, oh, but you can't have done exactly what we did because there are things that, are, that we didn't put in the paper that are only documented in the analysis note. Um, so you have these biases from your methods that you're using um, and you're usually correct. They're often corrected using some model, but then you're only right if the model you use to do the corrections is right. Your jets look more like the medium because generally when you have jets interact with the QGP, we expect that they lose energy. So they are made out of softer particles that are spread out more. Any interactions with the medium are going to make the particles in them lower momentum and spread out more. So if you have, if you're trying to study jets, the ones that interacted look more like the um, the background. And then these are some technical papers that basically say jets that were formed by a leading quark um, are narrower and fragment into harder particles, to higher momentum particles than jets that are formed by gluons. So all of our techniques to look at smaller jets and to look at high momentum um, and to look at to look at narrow jets at high momentum, this all biases us towards quarks, which means we're only seeing part of the picture. Um, and I'm gonna skip that last one because it's a little technical. So here, you don't need to um, know the technical details of this, but of what this measurement is measuring. That's less, that's less significant, significant to my point. The red boxes show the preliminary measurement that was reported at a major conference. And this is the ratio of this observable in lead-lead collisions to proton-proton collisions. So this paper was presented at a conference and everybody said, 
oh my goodness, jets are not modified in heavy ion collisions. And um, that's shocking. How did we get there? This doesn't meet, doesn't, isn't described by any of our models and people were very excited by this measurement. The green and the yellow show what was eventually um, published and, two, and this part is low momentum and this part is high momentum. For the preliminary measurement, um, the, they had a threshold in momentum, so they were only looking at high momentum constituents, and they were only looking at the highest momentum jet in the event. Um, so you basically were looking for the elephant that's sticking its nose out. And when you look at the elephants that stick their nose out, they look the same as elephants that are walking around uh, in the plains. Um, but if you try to look at the entire sample, you see, you see the differences, you start to see some of the differences that we would expect. And the point I want, so what you see depends on where you look and going back to this again, you always have to think very carefully about what exactly you are measuring. Um, so a lovely, a lovely contemporaneous example is Knox County Schools um, data on COVID cases uh, is consistently about a factor of three below the number of school age children reported by the Tennessee Health Department. So why is that? Well, Knox County Schools is only reporting the kids whose parents have gotten and responded to contact tracing from the health department and only listing them in their totals after the parents have responded, but only for the 10 days that the case is active. So in my case, I got contact tracing from, uh, for my son eight days after he tested positive. Um, and he would have then if they turned around and told, oh, and I also had to say that he went to Knox County Schools on said form. And then they, if they turned around and told Knox County Schools right away, he would have only been included in the statistics for two days. Um, actually, no, one, because he tested positive a day after he fell ill. So um, data it's not that data are manipulated, it's that you have to look very, very carefully at what is actually reported. Okay, so, um, most studies in heavy ion collisions will explicit, implicitly apply, either explicitly apply a bias, so they're, look, they're requiring a high momentum particle, implicitly apply a bias. So the ATLAS jet measurements say that they are inclusive, but then they required that jets had to be matched to a track jet with at least 10 GeV. And so there's either an explicit or an implicit bias most of the time. And they tend to focus on small jets at high momentum. Um, and you should always be cautious of the conclusions because they often aren't thinking about survivor bias. But here's the kicker, and this is why you guys are here. Backgrounds, in my humble opinion, and this has been the um, rant that I've been going on for a couple of years, background subtraction should be part of the definition of the algorithm because you're doing things that are not benign. Let me pause there. We are at 144. Um, that was dense. Have I totally lost you? It was definitely interesting. Um, like, I'm still just amazed at how physicists are just able to know what to look at on these graphs. Because to me, it just looks like, like, I don't know, I don't know what it says. But the fact that you guys know exactly where to look to understand what that means. Ah, we um, don't always. But most of the time, I guess. Ah, you will never hear people stand up and give a talk and tell you they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> but 
Yep, this also, one's just really I wasn't interesting to me. Trying to get you to absorb everything. Um, like, I think it's good to have the background. I think a lot of stuff we've talked about today, you don't actually need to understand at a super high level. Garrett, I think I heard you. I didn't say anything. Okay. I did have a question Christian. about um, what you wanted me to do from Wednesday. Okay. Um, let's table that for a minute. This might be a good breaking point. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, I'm not seeing any. I am going to stop the recording if I can.